Thank you all for joining us at the opening of the Frugal Innovation Lab. I'm Thane Kreiner, the uh, Executive Director of the Center for Science, Technology and Society here at Santa Clara. We're one of three centers of distinction that embody the university's mission to create a more just, humane and sustainable world. And many of you know about the university's strategic priorities, which I think the Frugal Innovation Lab embodies extremely well, particularly global engagement, which you can see all of the kinds of projects that are taking place with social entrepreneurs who have come through the Global Social Benefit Incubator, our signature program at the center, and engagement with Silicon Valley, uh, as embodied in the Maker Lab and other ac uh, activities here. So we're very, very proud to be in partnership with the School of Engineering in incubating and launching the Frugal Innovation Lab, and it has also spawned a whole series of distinctive courses that distinguish Santa Clara University from any other university. We love the concept of being able to help the, bottom, the base of the pyramid. We had this tagline, which you see up there, engineering with a mission. We had created that back in late 2007, and in some sense this helps us put some legs under the concept of engineering with a mission. This is a combination of a great great line of thinking, and we're just happy to be doing that during our centennial year. So I'll turn it over now to the two instigators of this concept, which should uh, be the ones cutting the ribbon. We will, we will do that. Thank you, Godfrey. And in the interest of uh, frugal innovation, there was not much money spent on these centers. So, uh, the whole, I think this is only supposed to be an hour panel. It might take us that long to cut the ribbon. <laughs> uh, I would have you cut. Great achievement. It was Rada's idea, and uh, my background as a CEO, what a good CEO does is when uh, one of their partners or team members has a really good idea, they say yes and get out of the way. And so uh, that's what I did with Frugal Innovation. Rada had the idea, the passion, uh, and uh, we figured out how to fund it. Uh, and. We're off to a, to a great start. I think doing an awful lot of good with a little amount of money and with some real innovative ideas and approaches to solving uh, large scale problems in uh, communities that are under resourced, whether they be in the United States or outside or global, and working with the students and the faculty of the engineering school, oh, it's been. It has been quite a dream come true. And I just want to say real big thanks to Godfrey for engineering with a mission, for Thane, your passion and working, and, the global, and Jim Cook with the Global Social Benefit Incubator. If you look at the projects here, a majority of them are examples of with the social entrepreneurs of the GSBI, or many of them are. I wouldn't say majority. More will be forthcoming. And um, a special word, uh, we dedicated a wall to Professor Dan Strickland and for his love and for and contribution to renewable energy technologies. We miss him dearly and we hope to have more projects like his uh, reversible fuel cells and students working on it. And thank you, Jeff, for being a partner, for funding it. And since it's so frugal, I'll let you cut it. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. We'll hope we can do this uh, quickly. Oh, I think it works. <laughs> hey. All right. So what I'd like to do is uh, allow each of our presenters to talk a little bit about their work and, the and the process as well to address a couple of questions. One is, what are the prob how are problems and solutions different in the area of frugal innovation, and how do you design for underserved markets? Okay, so I am, to be forget, I'm computer science and engineering. My area is mobile computing, and yeah, there's some slides here that have control. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so, and people are always asking me, but what is frugal about mobile computing anyways? When we think frugal, right, we think, you know, a smartphone and, you know, be able to browse, you know, from your car. That's what I think about mobile computing, right? And what's frugal about that? This is actually very fast computing, actually, when you think about you have access from anywhere and out to basically anywhere. However, when you think about from a different perspective, mobile computing is actually intrinsically frugal, right? Basically, you're using your phone as a computer. It's a powerful thing that you have, but it's a phone. So there's a lot of things that you can do with a phone that you already have. 
So in emerging markets right now, we learn that these phones, in, in basically SMS or texting, are being used to solve problems that people have, especially for access to information. They don't have internet, they don't have computers, so information that we all take for granted is really hard for them to basically get. So phones are being used for that. So basically you're able to distribute information and educate people and, and with health issues and things like that through a phone. So basically it's frugal because it's a simple device. They already have it. So they're not buying anything new or making anything more powerful or more expensive. So it's frugal because it's already there and we're using a resource that it's you know, already part of their life. They're already using it for something else, for you know, improving their life. So basically, recently, these SMS-based phones are enabling simple phones to access the whole internet. So this is a very powerful concept when you think about it. So it's a simple phone. It's not the same phones that we have here. But they are able to basically get access to a lot of information and even like to the internet right now, you know, through these special browsers. OK, so that's maybe answering your question. How is this different from here? Well, in here, phones are very powerful and sophisticated, right? We can actually do lots of things with phones. And also, we have basically a lot of access to 3G and Wi-Fi pretty much everywhere. And this enables like a, a lot of powerful applications to basically do different things. In emerging markets, we don't have that. So things are very different in there. The phones are simpler. And basically, all the communication is through text. You don't really have you know, 3G and Wi-Fi. Everything is through text. So that means it's very limited. The resources are very limited. So in, you cannot do the same kind of things you can, you can in, in, in here in developed countries. But you can still do a lot more than, than if you didn't have that. So basically, these simple phones are enabling people to have access to a lot more than they used to have. OK, so what's Another thing that is different is that solutions for in specific problems, they need to be basically customized for communities. And this is what makes it complicated. It's not like one size fits all. Like here, people come up with like, you know, a new app, and everybody jumps into it, because it's more for fun than anything else. When you're trying to solve a problem, the problem is specific to a community. So you have to understand that in order to do something that makes sense. Otherwise, people are just not going to use it, and it's basically an effort for nothing. So problems are different depending on the, you know, where you are or the kind of community you have. And the other problem that they have is the communities are isolated. So how do you even market for that? How do you replicate? How do you make it scale if, you know, first of all, problems are related to a special community. And even if you have the same problem in different communities, how do you even make these people hear about it and replicate it and, and make it so that more people actually use it? So these are problems that are very different than, than here when, where we actually all have access to the same things. And we all see what's going on all the time on the internet and on the news all the time. So. These are, you know, things that are different between here and in developed countries. And so some of the main challenges that we have in this area is basically understand the needs of the community. How do you go around and, and actually know what's going on? So going to India helped us a lot because we actually saw, you know, the real needs. We saw that it's actually making an impact. When you go there and see, like, you know, people using phones everywhere with, you know, very different kinds of, of um, of goals, we understand that you know it can help, but you have to understand how it will help. What do they really need? And dealing with the limited resources there make a big difference because basically we don't have it here. So you have to totally change your mindset from the you know smartphones are like a fancy gadget to simple phones are a very important tool and and create for that. So develop applications that will help people in specific points. So that's my main speech for. I was, I was. Right there. <laughs> So we can come back to this because you make a very interesting point. Designing with user needs in mind, how do you do that from this laboratory in this rarefied place called Silicon Valley? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So going abroad is a big part of that and sending the students abroad to understand that and give courses on, on rea different realities. Taking the students, you know, not even just going, but even here when you teach a course and you show what's going on and you bring people to talk about it, show them, you know, that there are different realities. Of, you know, these phones are used in totally different scenarios. It's basically not the same. You have to really create the environment so that they understand how to develop for these, you know, different situations. So the more partners we have abroad, you know, the better for us to understand and, and basically, you know, do the right job because it, it's really specific, right? So you better really understand the scenario. There's a uh, I think this bringing the world to, usually we say taking Silicon Valley to the world, this is bringing the world to Silicon Valley. 
one of the things we are starting to do and hope to really expand on is to bring examples of those projects to be able to display your because students can spend time in the rooms as you walk into the mobile health lab you'll see examples we'll have videos so they can actually have experiential learning sitting here about the environment and the second thing is there there are companies like we talked about zmq which is mobile for development that's a company in india and and one of the things we hope to do is to partner with them because they're looking at things on the ground and then send our students there and faculty there and have a really rich exchange program right. as well. Very okay. interesting. Ho Yen Lee is a mechanical engineering professor and, and Miller Fellow working in the energy space. My name is Ho Yen Lee. Um, I'm, an assist, I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. Um, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in collaboration with CSTS on the energy and water issue for the last three years or so. Um, so again, I want to echo what Sylvia talked about. The challenge is understanding the needs of the communities. So because I'm providing energy solution and water solution, because I have to evaluate how much water or energy need they have, I mean, they want. But actually, it's always different from what I expected. So if you have, let's say if you have some energy source that you can barely light up the for studying or cooking at night, but actually the community people will not use that energy for lighting because they've been without lighting in the dark for more than 20 years. Why not another day? They want to use it for television if they have energy or cell phone charging. They want to enjoy the, the, as much like cultural life as we do here. So always sizing is quite important thing and we don't know what they exactly need um, that's one challenge, and whenever I want to develop some um, the uh, vertical innovation or design a product for them, then I try to use the local material as much as possible, and that's one of the um, so the vertical innovation criteria you can see over there. A nice drawing, um, and also um, try to minimize the level of training because we don't know the low, how much knowledge they have so we want to make it as organized as possible. That's what Rada always emphasize about. So there are two examples of my project over there. So one is like um, water supply for off-grid area and also another thing is efficient cook stove. Um, it also, I mean, not only reduce the amount of the coal consumption or fuel consumption, but also it can generate some amount of energy out of that using so-called thermal electric module. So the key element in the local cook stove is how to make a good insulation. Okay. So, but um, you can buy a lot, of, a lot of insulation materials from Lowe's or from Home Depot, or you can also order from McMaster.com or something like that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. It's not actually mine, but I brought, I mean, my students brought it from Nicaragua. So actually, my students went to Nicaragua and learned what kind of materials are available over there. And after that, they realized what is the need and what kind of design should be done. So fortunately, local people have a lot of skills on metal processing, like welding and cutting. Those, those are not a big deal. I mean, sometimes it is some huge issue for our students, but uh, for local people, it's a pretty simple process. And they have galvanized steel, which can be easily um, get in the local community as well. And problem is insulation, as I mentioned. Well, again, in Home Depot, you have lots of options with different R value, which means the how resistant it is thermally. But um, local people don't have as much choice as we have. So what they use is in, I mean, Nicaragua is actually um, volcanic, uh, has some volcanic activities. So they use pumice rock. So pumice rock created by a volcano, it's a lot of pores, and it has very, very low thermal conductivity. Actually, that is not, sorry. That's, not, <laughs> That's, That's not pumice rock, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's heavy. So. <laughs> So um, that's one way to create like um, the good insulation. But one of the critical things that makes it frugal is how do you make it affordable to the end user?
care to comment now or do you want to come back to that after? Um, that's a very good question. So um, my students also did a survey when they had a chance to go to Nicaragua. And that put still, now you can see over there, that's $20 per piece. Well, they're living on like $4 per day, so $20 is not pretty cheap. But out of $4, they spend like 2 or $3 on fuels. So think about that way. So if you use, I mean, that can actually reduce the amount of like um, the fuel consumption by more than half, then the payback period is just like 20 days or so. So the problem is if they are willing to pay like $20 in advance or not, but that kind of problem can be done in conjunction with like microfinance, something like that, and give us a good problem. Let me introduce our, our third presenter, Ashley Kim in bioengineering, and whose focus is on the area of health. So hi everyone, I'm Ashley Kim from bioengineering, and uh, my research here in general is in microfluidics, so meaning we are developing a miniature platform that offers the complete functionality of the conventional bench steps system we can see in the conventional lab settings. But um, so, like the frugal innovation to me in a sense is to start with the needs of the uh, poor customers and working backwards to develop effective solutions for that. So in order to do that, first of all, you need to know what kind of lab, set lab settings we have in these developing worlds. So as you can imagine, that typical condition can vary a lot from one center to another. And here's an example of the picture with the very little lab uh, resources. So as you can see, there's no running water, there's no electricity. So no electricity actually has an important implication in diagnostic tests because we don't have refrigeration, that means. So that means you have to think about the reagent storage as well. So because of that, so looking at these needs, actually WHO came up with a set of criteria for the diagnostic tools for the developing world, and also abbreviated as assured. So each one represents affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid and robust, equipment-free, and de delivered to the ones who need it. So actually, not surprisingly, many of these criteria overlaps with the core competency we have in the global innovation. So we won't go into, I won't go into the details on uh, each one, but I want to point out a few things specific for the diagnostic test. So first one, sensitive. So mean, you, means that you need to have very few false negative results. And specific means you also want to have very few false positive results and user-friendly. So imagine what kind of training level they had in this uh, field worker. So probably high school diploma would be something you could imagine. So you have to think about this when you design your product. Your data should be very easy to interpret. So it might give you some kind of scaling, but the end result should be very easy to interpret as well. And another criteria should be very rapid. So in general, rapid diagnostics is a good thing. but the reason why this is especially important in the developing setting is that you cannot guarantee that these patients will come back for the follow-up visit. So what you want to do is, while they're here, you want to find out the result and want to do the follow-up at that time. So that's why also it's very critical. And equipment free. So as you can see, like if you have no electricity, then you don't want to have any bulk equipment that will need uh, uh, grid power in these settings. So my research area is actually, the microfluidics has several advantages because we are shrinking down um, our sizes, and that actually satisfies many of the requirements. But uh, the specific problem we are interested in is the water problem. So every year, 4 million people die from diarrhea because of drinking uh, unsafe water. And the biggest toll is on the children under the age of 5. And to show the severity of this problem, so this number is actually greater than the uh, mortality combined from war terrorism and the weapons and destructions combined. So water problem is a very severe problem. So our approach to solve this problem is this. So if you look at the solutions in the market these days, there are two extremes. So the left hand side is the expensive permanent instrument with the disposable part made of microfluidic chips. So that picture is actually from the company called Seafit. That's the leading company in the microfluidics. And that's actually selected as the official TB test recently. <laughs> yeah, we visited the company uh, last year. So it's a very sophisticated machine. So the permanent part contains the, all the uh, instrument parts. 
So in this machine, what they can do is they can purify the DNA from the patient sample, amplify this, and have the detection at the end. And that disposable part is the part you put your sample and insert into the machine and get the result. So it's very sensitive and very specific, but as you can imagine, you need the electricity and uh, it's quite expensive. So even with the aids uh, from the health organizations, still the testing kit itself, the cartridge is about 17 bucks, and the whole machine costs about $17,000. So now if you look at the other side of the extreme, is the lateral flow immunoassays. So we all know pregnancy test, so that's a good example of the lateral flow test. It's very easy and it's very disposable and also quite cheap. But what you get is just a yes or no answer. So now what we like to do is to develop these advantages of from these two extremes. So what we're proposing here is to instrument-free, sophisticated disposable combined with the cell phone for the quantitative readout. So here what we are working on, so one of the senior design project is actually the left hand side picture. And what we are making is the two-dimensional paper network. So instead of having just one D-letter flow, now we can do the series of reactions. And we can look at the result at the end of the strip. So that's the first part. And here, since we are using the paper, so you can just use the capillary to move the fluid instead of using the pumps or the valves, which can also uh, eliminate the necessity of the power. And now, to replace this expensive instrument part, what we are proposing is to use the cell phone. So also another project, senior design project this year, is to work on the uh, water pathogen analyzer, combining our detection mechanism and also uh, miniaturization of the measurement and also the cell phone mobile, uh, mobile applications. So uh, our group is working on the detection part and um, Shoba Krishnan in electrical engineering and her students working on miniaturizing the measurement part and Sylvia and her students working on the mobile application of the, doing the measurement. And I, I guess the other thing I hear you saying is that you're really in the middle of a process here of trying to figure out a whole a total solution. Where, what's most critical that you need to work with now and how did your trip to India influence your thinking about what's most critical mm -hmm. next? Mm -hmm. Do you comment on that? Or? Sure, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing is that, uh, like coming back to the point, that you really need to understand the customer needs first. So uh, when our student group started to work on the project, so the first thing they did was to do the interview with the people in India and they learned a lot from this experience. So the design consequently changed a lot uh, from this uh, interview process. And also, so when I visited uh, one of the organizations, e Health Point in the India, which provides the safe water and the telemedical conferencing to the community in the villages, um, so I asked them this question, so what's your most typical challenge? And they said education was the most typical part. So technology itself is also very important, but they say that, uh, so they provide this clean drinking water, but they don't make this connection in the beginning. So I asked them, so how did you do it? And they said, so first they teach the community, so first you need to understand the community and understand their culture and custom. And once you're done with that, so you now teach them what choices they have and what consequences you have from each choice and then let them make that choice. So that part is also very you know, difficult to get from us, like just reading the paper, but I think it's also very critical part of the flow innovation as well. In business school, that's called social marketing, but, uh, educating the market. Mm -hmm. but, uh, have an appreciation of the value of the, of the product. Rada, tell us about your work in Vietnam and livelihoods. So, I think the, the first thing I would say is these core competencies we're talking about, you'll find them all over, in fact, behind, it was supposed to be a backdrop, it talks about the frugal innovation core competencies, and as you listen to each one of the professors here and to the students, the whole idea of this lab is to bring alive those core competencies and those examples, so students who take courses who are involved with projects and things like that, can wander through the lab and sit at each station, look at the different examples. There are, I think, four or five projects that Sylvia has in the mobile health lab. And so you'll see this all around. Some students start to get ideas and faculty do as well. Also make it a center where corporations can come in 
and you know whether you have a Google looking at well what are the Android apps for social benefit or you have a Cisco coming in and looking at networking kinds of things so they start to get that idea as well. We have as we are talking about these products we want to take two minutes and talk about one of the GSBISCs, We Care Solar. And uh, the reason I want to share this with you, because Pratina went down and actually bought, brought the product. We could have had the CEO here, but we wanted to really see how they incorporated frugal core competencies. In fact, the comment she made to Katrina was, oh my gosh, look at all these core competencies. I think we have each and every one of them incorporated into the design. And she had an old version of it, and then the newer version of it. So I just want to sort of put this in perspective, and then I will talk about Anadeep. Is that okay, Mr. Uh, that'll be okay. So, um, in part of my learning how to use um, the solar suitcase was actually through the design iterations of the frugal innovation process. So, just as an intro to what We Care Solar is. Um, it's an organization that provides reliable solar lighting solutions to primarily medical facilities um, that currently don't have reliable um, sources of energy. And so by um, the first design was on actually a piece of plywood and that one didn't come along because that's part of their museum now. Um, but this iteration was one of the first ones, um, I think I can actually take this out and show you. So you see a lot of wires, exposed wires showing, um, <coughs> not much signage. It's pretty, it's pretty intimidating if you don't know what all these components are. Um, and so when they first brought this technology to an actual delivery room and medical facility, um, they noticed that there were certain fundamental flaws to the design that would make it difficult for people to use and potentially turned off from the technology and the, you know, the benefit it was actually providing. Um, and one of those factors was um, these switches. So you have multiple inputs to the system. You have your solar panel that gets mounted that charges a battery through the rays of the sun that's captured. Um, and then that charge goes to feed the different loads that you put on. You have two light switches, you can have cell phone charging, things like that. And so they realized that people were inadvertently turning off their solar panel when they meant to turn off their light. To s and so one of the first things they did was separate the two. So now you have your on switch on one side of your box and you have your lights on the other. So it's impossible to turn one off when you mean to turn the other off. Um, and so there's much more. I can give you the whole spiel uh, later during the open house portion, but just to touch on a few of the key points um, was the really the education piece, as Ashley brought up, um, that a device like this can provide not only the lighting, um, but it can it provides charging. So if you have a cell phone, you don't need to travel distances to charge your phone. You actually have that service more locally. But if people charge their phones um, during the day, instead of going to charge their lights and let their battery fill up, they get to the nighttime and they've used up their battery and they can't pull more from the sun because there's no sun to pull from. Um, and so that's what's crucial about the education piece of this, um, that the CEO really pushes at the communities where she implements this, is that during the daytime, when there's sun outside, you can charge your cell phones. And if there's no sun outside, only use the lights. Because um, you really want to you know, conserve your light for when you need it, because that was the whole problem, that women were dying in childbirth, being turned away from hospitals, because they had no light. Um, and so as a, Laura Statchel, the um, founder, is a, an obstetrician, and so she found that you know, unacceptable, that people were bleeding in the streets for the lack of light. So um, 
come visit this station <laughs> in the panel and you can plug in the lights and see how easy it is to use. They're um, shipping 100,000 of these. Wow. I'm amazed. I talked to her. Yeah, we, we know. We, I talked to her for a while on the, uh, on Friday, and she's uh, she's like, "Get me a COO, rather right now. I need one. I'm going crazy." But they are very interested in looking at having some students look at how they can be redesigned to make these more rugged, uh, more user centric. And she reeled off a bunch of the core competencies that we're talking about. <laughs> It's an interesting data point, I think, maybe for all of you, this last point in regards to market penetration. Um, I think when she, um, Laura came through the GSBI, I believe the price to the consumer was about $1,500. Now she's under 1000 so she's taken end-user price down that much. So, uh, it, But it's remarkable if she's achieved that level of market penetration. I think there's something like 300,000 clinics she had identified in, the, in developing countries where this would be an appropriate solution. Tell us about Anadip. So Anadip started off um, basically looking at rural people, especially rural youth. And the thing you hear about rural youth is that they're poor, they are a burden on society, they can become insurgents. And we started looking at it and saying, what is the power of rural youth? They're educated, 10th or 12th standard educated. How do you make them an invincible force? And we looked at this whole thing of impact sourcing. So we work with rural youth and women to, if you go to the, to the next one, um, basically in bringing uh, livelihoods to rural youth and women, particularly minority uh, communities, Muslim women, I'll talk about one of our projects. And our whole belief is, if livelihoods come in and there is some job creation and there's some economic development, then the things that Ashley and Sylvia and Hoyan are talking about, energy, health care. So if you look at that, if you have jobs in the middle, the other pieces of clean water, energy, health care, etc., really start to become pieces of the puzzle. And we're actually finding that that's starting to happen as the jobs are being created. We have trained, uh, skilled about 10,000 rural youth, and we have more than 90% placement. I'll talk a little bit about the process a little bit. But basically, they are then into their communities bringing in the clean water or healthcare solutions or agriculture, mobile solutions with agriculture. And they're using in the fisheries areas where most of our people are woodcutters, fishermen and very, very low, maybe they, they don't even earn, like a majority of them don't earn like two to three dollars a day. It's under that. And so they're bringing wealth into those communities and thereby bringing these different pieces. So um, if you, um, go, sorry, I'm still operating this. But if you go, so I